Hello and welcome to The Farming Week, the podcast from AgriLand that keeps you up to date with all the latest in Irish agriculture. I'm Charles O'Donnell and I'm joined today by journalists Ashling O'Brien and Francis McDonnell. This week we learned from Met Aaron that March 2024 was among the wettest marches on record and that the approaching Storm Kathleen will bring strong winds with status orange warnings for several counties for Saturday. You won't be surprised, therefore, if we start this week once again with the ever-increasing challenges brought on by the wet weather. After calls from all farm organisations, as well as many government and non-government TDs and senators, we have now seen some tangible process on that uh, this week, Ashling, haven't we? Well, I think the latest announcement from Minister for Agriculture, Charlie McConnellogue, will be welcomed by Farmers Charles um, because the impact of looming farm inspections when the weather and ground conditions are this poor across the country it was causing an awful lot of additional stress to farmers that they definitely don't need at the moment. And it was something that farm organisations and industry raised during last Friday's meeting of the National Fodder and Food Security Committee meeting, which was convened by the minister. Now, they said that inspections could be deferred until the weather improves and farmers are in a better place. So what has been confirmed by the minister today, Thursday, is that all non essential agricultural inspections will be paused until April 22nd. The minister said he was extremely conscious of the pressure on farmers as a result of the exceptional adverse weather conditions out there. And he's asked the Department of Agriculture to pause farm inspections um, not specifically required to support farm payments until April 22nd. And he said in considering this matter, he was conscious of the need to avoid any action that might affect payments to farmers. So I suppose non-essential farm inspections will be paused. But if they are related to you receiving a farm payment, they seem to be going ahead still because that will impact the delivery of your payment, Charles. So that is what has been announced by the minister. And I think the minister also commented on uh, his engagement with Chagask to try and work out, I suppose, a system to get fodder moving around the country. Maybe farmers who have it, you know, giving it to farmers who are lacking it at the moment. Yeah, that's correct. So the minister said that the National Fodder Committee is going to meet again next week. And ahead of that meeting, he's asked Chagas to develop what he called a system which would coordinate support to farmers who are under pressure when it comes to to fodder stocks. So as you said, this system would essentially coordinate uh, advisors around the country to help farmers to maximise existing fodder stocks and to provide a link for farmers with surplus silage stocks to engage with those who are struggling at the moment. And during last week's meeting of the committee, we heard that although some farmers are in real difficulty out there when it comes to fodder stocks, a lot of them are seeing the back wall of the silage pit or they've run out of bales and they're in a a real predicament out there. There are sufficient fodder stocks, we heard, around the country currently. And the minister believes that this system will support the optimal use of available stocks. And he said that Chagask will report back to the committee next week on how it's all progressing. Now, just to put some context on this, Charles, during last Friday's meeting, we heard the results of fodder surveys carried out by Chagask. And I suppose bear in mind that these results were given on Good Friday, which was March 29th. So obviously time has passed since those uh, results were given and it has to be taken in that context. So we heard that 784 dry stock farmers responded to the survey last week, the majority of whom were based in Leinster and Munster. Now, Now half half of the respondents respondents said said that they they would would run out of silage in the next three weeks, with 29% of those having silage stocks of between zero and 10 days. So you can imagine that that is getting very tight on those farms now, Charles, if ground hasn't dried up enough to get animals out of sheds. 35% of the farmers said that they were currently buying in silage and 44% of those reported that bales were costing them between 30 and 40 euro per bale. Now, only around a quarter of dry stock farmers said they had some cattle at grass. 66% said that slurry storage was becoming an issue on their yards. And we heard that workload along with slurry storage was a real, real pressure on farmers as well at the moment, along with fodder supply as well. 
Now, the survey also showed that 89% of respondents had not spread any fertilizers so far this year. And based on the feedback from Chagask advisors, we, we heard that most livestock farms are at least seven to 10 days away from turning out large numbers of livestock at the moment. And uh, the advice that was given is that farmers who were unable to graze heavy covers on silage ground to apply a small amount of nitrogen and then cut in early to mid-May, if possible, to do your first cut silage that early. Um, Now, in the dairy side of the house, advisors were reporting that 51% of dairy farms were behind on their grazing rotation. 39% have little or no grazing done and 10% were on target. 47% of dairy farmers said that animals were fully housed at the moment, while 49% were getting out to grass by day. And 7% of advisors reported that more than a quarter of their dairy farmer clients had run out of silage and the majority of those were based in Waterford, Wexford and Kilkenny. Uh, 66% said that silage was available to buy locally, but that stocks were limited. Now, 58% of the dairy farmers had applied some fertilizer and slurry, 35% have only spread slurry and 7% have not applied fertilizer or slurry. And the committee heard that farmers should not rule out grazing for the next week entirely. And Joe Patton, the head of Chagas Dairy Knowledge Transfer Department, said that even two or three dry days could make a big difference on some farms out there, Charles, you know, that could allow for daytime grazing, which, of course, is really important for dairy farmers. They don't need us to tell that, you know, they they can see their yields being impacted by having to house cattle and feed them silage and concentrates. And, you know, their solids are being impacted as well as we come into to peak milk season. So, you know, Joe Patton, just, I suppose, urging farmers not to throw in the towel for a week, you know, just to maybe go out and walk the land and see what they could possibly do, if even for a couple of hours in the day, just to get some grass into the diet. Mm -hmm. And Ashling, all this you're saying, it's obviously going to have a financial impact on farmers at the end of the day as well. Has the minister acknowledged that at all? Yeah, so the the fodder committee was told uh, by the farm organisations that cash flow is becoming a real issue on many dairy farms out there, Charles. And you spoke to Joe Patton yourself this week as well, and he estimated that it it could cost dairy farmers up to to 40 million euro, I think was the the figure that he, he gave in terms of the impact of this bad weather. Like, I mean, in some cases, we have animals that have been housed since last September and they're yet to see a blade of grass in a field, Charles. And, you know, it, it is really starting to to kind of get very tight on, on a lot of farms out there. And silage can be expensive to source and the quality sometimes can be questionable. And on top of that, farmers have the additional cost of feeding concentrates as well. So Minister McConlogue said that he has spoken with the main banks and he's asked them to ensure that access to short-term finance and overdraft facilities where needed are made available to farmers to help them deal with the pressures that they're facing. And he said that he's impressed upon the banks the need to show patience with farmers where cash flow issues are emerging in response to the current difficulties. And he said that Department of Agriculture staff are continuing to engage with the banks. And he said he would continue to monitor the overall situation very closely. Now, it has to be mentioned that at last week's fodder committee meeting, Louise Byrne, and she's the deputy chief inspector with the Department of Agriculture, said that there was no money for subsidizing feed purchases or having a fodder support scheme for 20 2024. And she acknowledged that some farmers are in difficulty out there, but she said that from what she was hearing at the meeting, there was an availability of fodder in the country. And she appealed to any farmer out there who's run out of silage to contact the department in confidence. So as things stand, as we're recording right now on Thursday, Charles, it doesn't appear that a fodder scheme is forthcoming from the department, which, of course, has a set budget for the year. And it would need to seek additional funding for any exceptional measure from the Department of Public Expenditure. But as this weather situation continues, and as you said at the, the top of the podcast, there's more unsettled weather on the horizon as well. The department may not be left with much of a choice not to come forward with some financial supports, if not for fodder, then perhaps for the tillage sector, who've been hit, of course, very badly by these horrendous conditions as well. We heard a lot of areas are reporting virtually zero planting for spring crops at the moment. And in some limited parts of the country, there's a maximum of just 10 
to 15% of planting being reported. So that's how stark it is for tillage farmers out there. And we have some advice in terms of planting um, on agri-land as well. You know, it, it is getting late for planting spring wheat, beans and spring oats, we were told by Chagask. But given the conditions that are out there and a possible shortage of spring barley seed as well, these crops may still be an option for tillage farmers, but that window is tightening all the time. And of course, then at the far side of the year, you're dealing with a later harvest as well, and there could be impacts on yields. So a lot of pressure, you know, on tillage farmers as well. And, and I guess before I finish, Charles, I just want to echo the sentiments of Mike McGann, the, the chair of the National Fodder and Food Security Committee, just for farmers out there to, to look out for each other at the moment, to check in with your neighbours and your friends and like allow them and yourself the opportunity you know, to share the challenges on your farm, to have a good vent because things are very, very hard at the moment. And although it's not going to maybe get the cows back out to grass any quicker, you know, or, or fill up the, the silage pit for you, you know, maybe sometimes getting something out into the open can help. And just to know that you're not alone and that many farmers are finding it very, very difficult at the moment. And, you know, look, stay tuned to AgriLand. We'll support farmers as much as we can with giving them as much information as they can, Charles. But I think, you know, Mike McGann made a really good point for, for farmers to look out for each other at the moment as well. And I think farmers won't be found wanting in, in that regard. Yeah, that's a hugely important message, I think. Uh, and sticking on the farm finance issue for a moment, but specifically on the dairy side, uh, Francis, there have been calls on milk processors to provide a so-called hardship payment to their suppliers uh, in light of the weather, hasn't there? So Charles, against the backdrop of this relentless weather, farm organisations have been warning that farmers desperately need to be supported at this time. The president of the Irish Farmers Association, Francie Gorman, has urged milk processors to return every cent from the market to dairy and livestock farmers as they battle the poor weather conditions. The IFA president believes milk processors should pay a hardship top up of at least three cents a litre on all March milk. Francie Gorman has highlighted that processors will not be paying for milk supplied in March until mid to late April. He said that given processors are fully aware of what he described as the dire situation their members and suppliers are in before they set the March milk price, they should move to support them with a much needed cash flow injection. And of course, when it comes to banks and credit unions, the IFA president also believes they should be offering maximum flexibility to farmers. So in relation to the Department of Agriculture, there's been a lot of debate about what's happening. And Francie Gorman believes that one way that they could actively support farmers at this time is by fast tracking any payments that are due to them. The president of the Irish Creamery Milk Suppliers Association has also called for the National Fodder and Food Security Committee to meet again as soon as possible. Dennis Drennan said that while the ICMSA doesn't want to panic farmers at this time, it is important to guard against what he described as any kind of complacency that could cause further problems down the line. He said, you know, well, cows can't be turned out, fertilizer can't be spread. The ICMA is already hearing about worries about adequate fodder for the next winter and what kind of quality, of course, that fodder will actually turn out to be. So he said that's why the organization would really like an update from the fodder committee to take stock of what the latest forecasts and estimates are. And as we've already heard, you know, with the minister moving to suspend non-essential farm inspections, that has been welcomed by farm organisations, particularly the Irish Cattle and Sheep Farmers Association. Its president, Sean McNamara, said that while Chagas has reported there's enough fodder to go around, its members on the ground are actually reporting a starkly different reality. So he said it's a really dire situation out there and it's time for government and for other organisations to move to support farmers at this time. Ashling, with all the jobs and the work that farmers should be doing in earnest now but can't because of the weather, that's of course going to leave contractors in a bit of a bind as well. And that's something that the Association of Farm and Forestry Contractors in Ireland has highlighted as well this week, hasn't it? Yeah, that's true. So Michael Moroni, the research director with the FCI, said that due to the current weather conditions, a lot of contractors are currently zero grazing silage ground, which they wouldn't have done in the past. And he said that slurry spreading has come to a halt in many places because understandably farmers don't want slurry spread on silage ground at the moment as they, they look ahead to hopefully first cut silage in, in the coming weeks. And uh, Michael Moroni said that up to now, contractors have been spreading maybe small amounts of slurry, maybe 
three or five loads per farm just in the driest of fields. So that means for the contractors, they have to come back a number of times onto the farm. That involves obviously repeated slurry agitation and there would be huge additional costs associated with that. Now, as I said earlier, Chagas have advised farmers unable to graze heavy coverts on silage ground to, to maybe look ahead to, to first cut silage in early to, to mid May if possible. But Michael Moroni said that, you know, the workload for contractors is a big cause for concern. And he said the thought among a lot of contractors out there is who's going to do all this work and who's going to be available because there is going to be so much work that has to be done in a short period between now and then. And he said it's going to put huge pressure on contractors out there. And the second part of that pressure, of course, then is that everybody will want slurry spread the day after silage is cut on their silage ground. So how is that going to be done as well? And he said that it'll be an issue that has to be looked at as well. Now, Moroni said that the increase in excise duty on fuel, we spoke about that on the podcast. He said that's going to add about 40 million euro in additional costs for contractors as silage season looms, which he said is difficult to pass on to, to farmers because contractors and farmers work together all year round and contractors will be you know, very keenly aware of the pressures, the financial pressures that farmers are facing, um, you know, along with the, the stress and the mental uh, stress and strain that they're facing as well at the moment. And Michael Moroni said many contractors out there are considering their future, Charles, because of the impact of the weather, uh, high machinery and operating costs as well. And, you know, trying to secure staff as well for contractors is very difficult. And Moroni said that very few contractors have any ploughing done for spring tillage crops, as we mentioned earlier, that the low rate of planting for, for spring crops. Uh, he said they've lost a lot of income and revenue because winter cereals are back and there's very little top dressing that's been done so far at this stage. And he said contractors in the south and the southeast have reported that only 10 percent of the spring cereal crops crops have been sown at this point. And when it comes to potatoes, he said that less than 10% of the early crops have been sown to date in County Wexford, for example. And there's also been an issue with destoning fields, which will have an impact then when it comes to, to harvesting those crops. And he also pointed to an interesting um, aspect as well in all of this uh, about hedge management. And he said that that has been impacted on many farms because of the weather conditions and less than half of hedges in fields have been trimmed, which is causing issues for or electric fences um, unearthing and look obviously a lot of stock are in housing at the moment but when they do go out you need those electric fences to be working and to make sure that they will keep stock where they should be and of course we're in the closed period at the moment for, for hedge cutting under the Wildlife Act it is an offence to, to do anything like that and the FCI said they had been in contact with the National Parks and Wildlife Service uh, looking for some leniency but that doesn't seem to be forthcoming at the moment so the FCI said that you know that's another issue that's facing farmers out there as well at the moment and it'll be interesting to see if there's any movement on that in in the future as well and Ashling, the conditions that farmers find themselves in at the moment is leading to pretty significant demand for feed and fertilizer to the point that it's hard for delivery drivers to get that produce around to farmers without actually exceeding their statutory limits in terms of how many hours they're actually allowed drive at a time but there have been calls for some sort of derogation to relax those limits hasn't there Yes, yes, that's, that's correct, correct, Charles. We, we previously, previously saw a derogation, derogation for hauliers uh, when, when it came to, to driving hours. hours. Obviously, these, these hours are recorded on a tachograph, which is, is part of the, the machinery on a, a lorry or a truck. And it, it, there are very obviously strict rules around how many hours that somebody can spend on the road, obviously enforced by the Road Safety Authority for, for good measure, of course, as well. We want everybody to be safe, whether that's the person driving the lorry or other road users as well. But John Coleman from the Irish Grain and Feed Association told the National Fodder and Feed Security Committee meeting last week that feed mills are reporting lead times of four to five days for feed due to the huge demand from farmers out there. And he said that transport is a big issue and it's limiting delivery for farmers. And he said that there were derogations in the past for drivers hours and he felt that the committee could put forward a proposal to bring that about again so that feed can be brought onto farms. And it's not just feed. He also pointed to fertilizer. He felt that there was very little fertilizer in merchants yards and also on farms at the moment. 
And he said that that would pose an issue for transport when weather conditions improve. And that was echoed by Liam Dunphy, the managing director of Gouldings. He also anticipated an increase in demand, of course, when ground conditions improve and, and farmers can, can get back out there with fertilizer. Uh, we heard that the figures earlier that Chagas had reported from their recent survey. And Liam Dunphy said that we're currently in a situation where roughly 25% of the annual fertilizer has gone out of importers' yards by March. March 31st. And he said normally that percentage is in the range of 55 to 60 percent. So in other words, that percentage of fertilizer needs to get out there to make the wheels turn, he said, in April and May to get the silage grown, uh, to get crops fertilized. And he said we're really a long way behind that at the moment. And if we're going to achieve that, we're going to have to look at maybe a derogation for, for hauliers to, to maybe get that fertilizer out onto farm. And he estimated that the country needs to move around a thousand lorry loads of fertilizer per day for every single day of April to make up the deficit, according to his calculations. And he also made the point as well that Although fertilizer prices have reduced from the, the heady heights that we did see in, in recent years, thankfully, he fe feels that there's a lot of confusion out there at the moment, Charles, amongst farmers about what they're actually allowed to use in, in terms of fertilizer. And he said the feedback from merchants and co-ops was that farmers are afraid of the nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, the NP and K limits. And they're not buying what they normally buy in terms of fertilizer because they're, they're worried that they'll go over those limits. And his take on it was that we have the scope to use more fertilizer nationally and we're not using it. And he said there tends to be a perception out there that we can't use it almost and that the reality is if we probably used our national allowance last year, he said we may not be in the situation with silage stocks that we're currently in. So, you know, it was very interesting. Michael O'Donovan told that meeting, he's the, the head of grassland science at Chagask, that 70% of farms had no nitrogen spread. Um, so, you know, that was a, a very stark figure as well. And Louise Byrne, the deputy chief inspector with the Department of Agriculture, said that the derogation would be a matter for the Department of Transport and the Road Safety Authority. And she said, but if there is a business case to be made, that it should be made to the Department of Transport and that that should be be copied also to the Department of Agriculture because their opinion would be sought on it. And it's something obviously that they're very much aware of now from industry and the, the shortfall that's out there in terms of feed and, and fertilizer deliveries and, and the need to have a look at it from the, the haulage point of view. Yeah, that was an interesting point about the fertilizer, actually, Ashling. And, you know, maybe it's a job of work there for the department and for Minister McConnell to maybe educate and inform farmers a bit about what they're allowed to do, actually, with fertilizer at the moment. It might bring some, some relief in some way at the moment. But you alluded, Ashling, earlier to the challenges that are out there and the obvious stress that comes with that for farmers. And obviously, it's hugely important for farmers to try to do whatever they can to just take some time for themselves. And a new museum in County Clare, which has just opened, might be the ideal way for farmers to get away from the farm, if only for a few hours. Can you tell us more about that, Ashley? Yeah, so this was one of the most popular stories this week, Charles, which demonstrates not only farmers' enthusiasm for machinery, obviously, but perhaps maybe as well the need for some escapism from the weather woes, as you said. Um, so the new museum, it's been officially opened in Kilrush in your own home county of Clare, Charles, and it's dedicated to the life of Harry Ferguson. Uh, Harry Ferguson, of course, from County Down, invented the hydraulic lift and revolutionised agricultural machinery renowned, of course, for the Massey Ferguson tractor. Now, the museum can be found beside the Museum of Irish Rural Life, and it's all the brainchild of Joe Whelan, and his family have run a Massey Ferguson dealership for 57 years. And the museum showcases a selection of tractors ranging from the 1930s to the 1960s, including a Ferguson Brown with iron wheels from 1936. And Joe Whelan is in his 80s, and he said the museum, which has been created at his own expense, is charting the progress of Irish farming. And all of the tractors that are inside in this museum are in working order and they've been restored painstakingly over the past 50 years. And pride of place in this museum goes to Joe's Ferguson Brown, which his sons Joseph and Kevin gave him as a surprise for his 70th birthday. Um, the museum has been brought to life as well by paintings of Courtney Westhoff O'Farrell, who depicted the life story of Harry Ferguson. So it's a really colourful, fabulous display um, of, of 
the charting the history of Harry Ferguson and all of these amazing tractors. And it was officially opened by Eden Derry man, William Judge from Agco UK. And both museums, they're open seven days a week, whether it's the Tractor Museum or the Irish Rural Life Museum, which I suppose if you're going to one, you might as well go to both of them. They're open from nine until six, seven days a week. Entry is free, but if you want to make a donation, of course you can. And anybody who's ever restored a vintage tractor will know that donations will be very much gratefully received because that is a labor of love. And fair play to Joe and all of the family for, for getting that off the ground and a great attraction in County. Claire and as you said Charles if just to get away from the farm for a couple of hours and if Claire is nearby you you know it might be a lovely day out for you and the family yeah it's uh, definitely Ashling and you know but a lot of us from farming backgrounds would have a machinery nerd in the family so I suppose <laughs> I can think of a lot of people who would be certainly uh, heading to Kilrush to, to check that out but that's almost all the time we have for today. Uh, just to mention briefly that uh, property advisory firm Sherry Fitzgerald uh, published its latest agricultural land and price barometer in the last week. And you can find out all about that on our sister podcast, AgriFocus, in which AgriLand editor Stella Meehan spoke to Sherry Fitzgerald's Philip Guckin on the current state of play for land prices. But that does bring us to the end of today's podcast. Please don't forget to rate, review and follow The Farming Week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love if you could spare some time to give us five stars and share the farming week with anyone you think might be interested. From Ashling, Francis and myself, all the best for the weekend.